FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today is July 10th, 2018. Tomorrow, I am on my way to Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. I'll be walking the floor. But look, uh, either tweet me or email me, kl at kerrylutz.com. Uh, if there's enough of you around, I'll buy you all lunch, okay? Hey, and that reminds me, as always, be a part of the show, participate, just send us an email to kl at kerrylutz.com. And we're trying to get Martin Armstrong on, but uh, haven't been able to track him down. I think he's on vacation, probably in Europe. They're probably asking him, what the heck do we do now, Marty? This thing is really bad. It's worse than we thought. What are we going to do? Anyways, we'll have him on in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned and I'll let you know. And right now, though, it's time for another Triple Lutz Report. This is episode number 457. That's right. We've done almost 500 Triple Lutz Reports. In case you're not familiar with the Triple Lutz Report, it's more commentary-based. Review of the news. We'll read some of your emails to us and comment, etc. So this one... You might have seen the article I wrote called Make Border Security Great Again, Privatize It. So look, the media is continually informing us that there is a major crisis at the U.S. southern border, although the crisis they perceive is that illegal aliens are being mistreated, they're dying, the families are being separated, and this is terrible. The real crisis is millions of them come over the border unabated, although Trump has put quite a dent in it. But still, little is being done about it. President Trump, he's got his ideas. The Congress appears completely unwilling to act. Parts of the wall are being built, albeit at a very slow pace, but it can't happen soon enough to quickly staunch the flow of illegals. Therefore, it's time to take an approach that always always works when it is tried. Unleash the power of capitalism to solve this seemingly intractable problem. It's time to privatize border enforcement. Yes, you heard that right. Privatize it. And look, in this country's early history, law enforcement was largely a private affair. Bounty hunters and bail enforcement agents were a private solution to a public problem. Nearly 200 years of experience with bounty hunters and bail enforcement agents, otherwise known as BEAs, has shown them to be an extremely effective solution in apprehending a broad spectrum of criminals around the country. When an alleged criminal, and I use that term alleged in Quotes, most of them are hardened criminals. When that person jumps bail or fails to appear for a court hearing, modern day bail enforcement agents working at the behest of a bail bondsman regularly apprehend large numbers of criminals and ensure that whatever justice is, whatever that concept means, they ensure that it is served. Today, most states as witnessed by Dog the Bounty Hunter, still re rely upon private individuals to ensure the swift apprehension of bail jumpers. That's hard to believe, isn't it? And largely they work on a bounty basis, meaning you catch your average criminal who's out on $10,000 bail. That's what the bail bondsman stands to lose. You get 1000 if he's out on $250,000 bail, you might get ten dollars or even $25,000. And that calls for a person like Dog, very qualified, able to grab these people without causing a big stink. And interesting is that this, this practice has never was never uh, voted on by the Congress. It In a case, uh, 1873 case, before the U.S. Supreme Court, Taylor versus Tainter, 
recognized that bail bondsmen, and it did it indirectly, it's what you would call dicta, it's not the holding of the case, but that bail bondsmen have sweeping rights to protect their bond and thus apprehend and even, get this, temporarily imprison their charges. And we all remember the Westerns, Wanted Dead or Alive, all these shows, Maverick, Bounty Hunter, where they go and they grab these guys who who are out on bail or there's a, a price on their head. And the U.S. government even does it to this day with terrorists, with criminals who've, who've absconded, dangerous criminals. They'll put rewards out for these people. And there's a private segment, a private industry, which tracks these people down and gets the rewards. So the interesting thing is that, like I said before, bail enforcement agents... BEAs have rights that are often superior to public law enforcement officers. Hard to believe. A person out on bail, the theory goes, expressly waives many constitutional protections, including the rights to refuse consent to search a dwelling, which in with the police, they would have to come back and get a search warrant and the entitlement to due process. Police would have to get a warrant and go grab these people. Here, if a bail enforcement officer sees you walking down the street and you've skipped your bail, jump bail, they can just grab you right then and there with no due process whatsoever. Now look, sometimes overzealous agents cause problems, including even injury or death, but the legal system has been pretty effective in dealing with these types of issues. So here's the deal. Extending the bounty hunter concept to illegal border crossers who attempt entry into the United States would result in reduced crossings and a substantial cost savings to the U.S. government. Did you know that there are presently 20,000 U.S. Border Patrol agents on the Mexican border? They secure almost 2,000 miles of border, 365 days per year, 24-7. Now look, like any other governmental agent, like the police, like anybody else, you got to take into account benefits. You got to take into account agent vacations. You know, these guys get a month off, sick leave pregnancy leave, personal holidays, mental health days, coffee breaks. You know, they get a break every hour or so, whether they take it or not. It's another thing. Holidays. And then you've got extremely poor management on the border. It, just like any other government agency, inefficient, ineffective. You know, they know the, uh, the illegals are coming in one area and they send all the agents out to another area. So, when you take into account all this, the actual number of agents on border patrol on any given shift, it's often only in the hundreds of people. Now, granted, throughout that 2,000 miles, they aren't crossing every point of it. But over recent years, they've taken to crossing harder areas like Big Bend National Park in Texas, very rugged, very challenging terrain, and people die crossing these these crossings, these illegal crossings every day. So the other thing is the Border Patrol is extremely costly. It's the United States' largest, largest law enforcement agency. Did you know there's over 62,500 employees, including about 50,000 sworn agents? So Border Patrol works up in Canada. They work in other areas, too, within the uh, heartland of the country. Not to be confused with ICE, which is Immigration Customs Enforcement. They're the ones tracking down the criminals or attempting to. But here's the thing. In 2016, this department's budget, we're talking Border Patrol, over $16 billion. Now, if we just divide $16 billion by 50,000 agents, okay, or 62,500, you know, their overhead per person, including that person's salary and including the cars, the planes, the management, uh, the $25,000 desks in their main offices, all this crap that they waste, but straight lining all expenses, labor, non-labor, over 
that number of people, it's over $200,000 per employee. So if we look, last year, Border Patrol apprehended somewhere around 400,000 illegal Mexico border crossers or Mexican border crossers. The average cost per apprehension turns out to be $10,000 or more. Hey, if there's a bunch of agents involved and there's a chase and it could be, it could drastically increase the cost if they have airplanes involved, which they've got their own little air force, all these things. So here's where the private sector comes in. The Border Patrol could certify training courses that all independent Border Patrol agents, or as I call them, IBPAs, would have to complete in order to receive compensation for apprehending illegals. And the U.S. would pay out a $500 to $1,000 reward or bounty only to certified IBPAs. Within weeks, there would be tens of thousands of these independent border patrol agents massed at the border. And I mean, you just know it would unleash a lot of people and they would all have to be certified or they couldn't get a bounty. In addition, they could earn additional bonuses for apprehension of convicted felons or repeat illegal crossers. And if they managed to catch a coyote, a person escorting more than 10 people across the border, uh, they could get another $2,500. So once an apprehension is made, they don't just hold on to these people. They will turn them into or deliver these people to a border patrol staging area where immediate deportation could take place. Or if this person is a felon, prosecution could take place as well. And this would free up the U.S. Border Patrol to concentrate more resources on capturing terrorists, drug smugglers, and human traffickers. But I'm talking like children, child trafficking, that type of thing, as well as creating more judges, appointing more judges to deal with fraudulent asylum seekers and clearing up the huge backlog of pending cases. I mean, hundreds of thousands of cases, hundreds of thousands of illegal successfully cross the border each year, and you know they create many, many problems in society. Just go to your local Home Depot and you'll see they'll have a staging area to hire illegal Mexican or South American help. No taxes, no nothing. And who knows about those people? Do so at your own peril. And look, even if the president and the Congress doubled the number of Border Patrol agents, on the Mexican border tomorrow, there would still not be enough agents to fully stop the flow, to cut it off. Privatizing the apprehension of illegal border crossers is going to free up law enforcement to address more important threats and dramatic, dramatically increase the number of apprehensions made and once again make America's border enforcement great again. So tell me what you think about that. Again, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. By the way, I'm going to be at the Sprott Conference in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. That starts, I think it's um, July 15th through the 19th, something like that. I will be there. Invite you to, uh, to reach out. Let's talk. A couple of you are there. I'll buy you lunch and we'll have some fun, although the food is usually really good at the Sprott Conference, yet another reason you should be attending. And I'll be doing interviews, and hey, if you got a good story, I'll interview you too. So next thing on the screen, Trump appoints Brett Kavanaugh as the, uh, the next Supreme Court judge, justice. I'm not really sure what the difference is between a judge and a justice. In some states, they're judges. In other states, they're justices. In New York State, it was justice of the Supreme Court, justice of the appellate division, court of appeals, whatever. Be that as it may, Trump appoints Kavanaugh to fill the seat of Anthony Kennedy. And this is fulfilling a campaign promise to, to appoint originalists, to appoint judges who respect the Constitution. There's questions about this guy. I mean, he said that... Uh, <laughs> that there's 
no, uh, well, during the whole Ken Starr thing, he was of the opinion that the death of Vincent Foster uh, was really a suicide that took place in Fort Marcy Park. Hey, I don't know. And I'm willing to cut the guy a break, but he was a bushy and he was appointed by H.W. Bush. He'd been Department of Justice, all this thing. He seems eminently qualified. We have no reason to think that he's going to uh, side with the deep state in any matters that come up, but let's see what happens. More importantly than that, this really isn't the most important appointment that Trump made. Really, the most important appointment that Trump made was Gorsuch in filling Scalia's seat, whether Scalia was murdered or blah, blah, blah. I, I can't get into that. I have no proof either way. Certainly, it was suspicious. Certainly, it demanded an autopsy, and certainly one wasn't done. Uh, you know, the place where he died, some Bohemian Grove, weird pervert hangout. I don't know. Like, I can't say. There's, and at this point, it doesn't really matter. But the reason why the appointment of Gorsuch to the Supreme Court was so important, more important than this appointment of of Kavanaugh to take Kennedy's seat is really interesting because you may or may not know that Gorsuch was a law clerk for for Justice Kennedy while Justice Kennedy was serving on the court many, many years ago. And whether you know it or not, law clerks, law secretaries, very, very important for judges because basically the judge will decide a case in a certain way and often he will assign his law secretary or his law clerk to write the decision in a way that he directs, or she for that matter. We do have two Supreme Court justices who are females. And obviously there was a strong bond between Gorsuch and Kennedy. And obviously Kennedy was pushing for Gorsuch to be appointed behind the scenes. Of course, it's not polite for Supreme court justices to lobby for their favorite pick to be appointed as judge of the high, the highest court in the nation. It just doesn't happen. It's not right, not allowed, but it does happen. All right. I don't mean to say it doesn't happen. It's not really known. Just like the court can be very political during the time of FDR and there was Judge Frankfurter. He was constantly in dialogue with, with FDR, helping to pass FDR's agenda. So don't believe that it doesn't happen. It does. It's just not reported on at the time. It's a big, deep, dark secret that everybody knows about. Same with Abe Fortas. He was buddy, buddy, mano, mano with LBJ. We all know this, and he resigned eventually in disgrace. It was really a shame. He was a brilliant judge. Some of his decisions really well written. Like I've told you before, the Supreme Court, many, many of these cases they get are contrived by the states to settle these issues once and for all. Roe versus Wade was a contrived case. There was no real controversy. You know, uh, Roe couldn't get an abortion, but she managed to get one anyway. But it was all put together by people who wanted to legalize abortion. So let me get back to my, my present thesis is that Gorsuch is so much more important than, than our guy here, Brett Kavanaugh. And the reason why is he made Kennedy less of a swing vote. From the time that, that Gorsuch was appointed, there were 19 five to four decisions. And guess what? Kennedy sided with the conservatives, the so-called conservatives on the court, 19 times. So these split decisions often deal with very contentious issues like Janus versus AFSCME, which said that public employee unions can no longer forcibly steal non-participating union or employees. You can no longer forcibly... Uh, make them remit dues or payments in lieu of dues when they don't want to be a part of it, which is pro-choice. Hey man, liberals, that's pro-choice at its best. 
Kennedy sided with the conservatives on that one. The point is that coincidentally or not, the appointment of Gorsuch to the court made Kennedy a lot less swingy a vote. You know, Kennedy was the swing vote. And oftentimes on these liberal cases, immigration cases, everything else, he sided with the liberals. And that made him the most the most powerful vote on the court. It's kind of like he was the tiebreaker. And and he, he played it to the umph. I mean, they were all kowtowing to him. But once his protege was appointed to the court, there was no more of that. He had to, had to side with the majority. And that is pretty cool when you think about it. Trump obviously knew this, or the people advising Trump knew it. And yes, Gorsuch is a superior judge, brilliant mind, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, whether there was a direct deal with Kennedy is like, hey, bef- until I retire, I will only side with with Gorsuch if you appoint him, or whether it just was like, hey, this is my guy here, I got to support him, or maybe Gorsuch is just so darn persuasive that Judge Kennedy found that he had to go along with him. I'm not sure why, but the result is the same. He went along with him. So effectively, when Trump appointed Gorsuch, he got two votes for the price of one. He got two judges for the price of one. And much to the chagrin of the liberals out there, they thought, oh, he's just replacing a conservative vote. Merrick Garland, who was, who was the Bamster's nomination, should have gotten it. But you know what? Nothing changed. And they couldn't have been more wrong. And now with the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh, it's just the acknowledgement or the making permanent, apparently so, that now there is a five to four majority or will be a five to four majority, permanent majority on the court. And when Ruth Buzzy Ginsburg croaks, which eventually she's going to, she looks horrible. Sotomayor, brittle diabetic, 61 years old, in horrible condition, overweight. And trust me, from family experience with type one diabetes, horrible, horrible disease, I'd never wish it upon anyone. You know, my sister had it for many years, finally passed away from complications of it. And man, you can't, it's really difficult to be a brittle diabetic and function properly, both in public and at home. Very hard to do. I only wish uh, Justice Sotomayor the best of health and the best of of life, what it has to offer. But But look, this is just... Uh, it's a demanding job, not so much physically because everybody is opening doors and carrying your briefcase and all that stuff. No, it's really a difficult job psychologically. It requires a lot of brain power and you got to have a thick skin. And hey, cool thing here, the, uh, the president, Donald J. Trump, he just pardoned the ranchers, uh, Dwight Hammond and his son, Stephen, uh, from uh, criminal imprisonment. Uh, basically, he uh, he's granting justice where justice wasn't uh, wasn't being had in the criminal and the civil sphere, and he's pardoned them. Hopefully, he'll do the same thing for the Bundys. Prayers are with the Bundys. Uh, they are freedom fighters of the highest highest regard. Interesting article in the New York Post. You know, I feel like uh, Men in Black, where Men in Black has uh, basically, they don't, they said, you can't find real news in, (laughs) you can't find real news in the regular media. You got to go by the tabloids to find the, what's really happening. And look, I don't think it's quite that bad, but, but a lot of times the National Enquirer scoops the uh, the regular media on very important stories. So I will stick with, uh, <laughs> I'll stick with the New York Post. It is part of the Murdoch, the Rupert Murdoch empire. And it's been a money loser from the day that 
he bought it and yet he and he had to sell it at one point because of Teddy Kennedy. He's gotten it back. Uh, you know, it's just the stories that they tell are so great. So there's the story here how New York City could wind up like San Francisco. And the premise is quite simple. Like San Francisco has got a problem with human excrement littering the streets. And they've got a lot of problems. And basically the post is warning that, that, uh, that New York city is on the same road as <laughs> New York city is on the same path to ruination as, uh, as is San Francisco. We're following in their footsteps. And, and it's really interesting because I couldn't agree with this more. Uh, New York City, you know, they're, <laughs> here it is. It's, it, it appeared in the July 8th edition of the New York Post. And they're saying that San Francisco's crisis looks like New York City's future. And like you saw, the major, major medical association pulled its annual convention out of San Francisco because the members no longer feel safe. You know, San Francisco is a beautiful city, but somebody just dumped 20 pounds of poop on a sidewalk last week in a clear bag, and it remained there for hours. And human waste-related complaints in San Francisco have skyrocketed 400% from 2008 to 2018. In 2017 alone, more than 21,000 reports were received. This is disgusting. And this is called quality of life enforcement. What happened in San Francisco, it stopped prosecuting quality of life offenses. And guess what? Shock of all shocks, the quality of life for the city's residents greatly decreased. It greatly diminished. In 2015, SF courts stopped enforcing bench warrants for such offenses, for quality of life offenses. Of course, the cops continued writing tickets for public drunkenness, sleeping in parks, public urination, etc. But when the judge, when the, when the accused fails to show up at their court appearance, judge dismisses the outstanding warrant. And New York started following San Francisco's lead in 2016, when Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance Jr. announced his office would no longer be prosecuting offenses such as public urination, both cities have accepted that they'll continue to have a large number of people living on their streets and using their sidewalks as a toilet. And look, New York is insane. It now spends half a million dollars a day housing homeless people in hotels and Post goes on to report that in one particular day in 2017, the city spent $648,000 booking homeless into $549 hotel rooms near Times Square. So that's not a solution. That is a Band-Aid approach. And, you know, New York also is following San Francisco's lead regarding public drug use. You heard there's thousands of empty syringes, needles, etc., on the streets of San Francisco, on the sidewalks, to the point where you can't wear sandals or open toe shoes because you might get stuck and then you could get AIDS. And the exact same thing is happening in New York. Look, I'm all in favor of legalization of drugs, but do it in your own home. Do not do it out in public. Do it in a private area. Do not do it in our parks. Do not do it on the sidewalks. You know, you don't need to get high so badly that you have to do it in public. Uh, just like you shouldn't be swallowing a bottle of vodka on a street corner. And yet, Bill de Blasio told police, Comrade de Blasio, mayor of New York, to stop arresting people for smoking marijuana in public. Look, since I've been a kid, people have been smoking dope in public in New York. Doesn't mean you should tolerate it. It should be allowed. Just stop it. Okay. And, you know, this is the type of thing New York has been on a roll for so many years since Giuliani started broken windows policing. I was having lunch with somebody recently and they bemoaned uh, Giuliani, hated him. I said, you can bemoan him because you didn't live or work in the city during the 90s 
and the 80s when the place went to hell in a handbasket dur- during Mayor Dinky Dink's uh, tenure, during uh, Abe Beams, during even Ed Koch. He wasn't real big on going after these public uh, quality of life issues. And it was like, what happened was, a lot what happened with Trump when he became president. When Giuliani was elected mayor, even before he was inaugurated, the cops cracked down on the squeegee men, on the public begging, and all of these people. And all of a sudden, quality of life in New York got better. Crime went way, 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 way down. Same thing has happened on the border. Trump wasn't even inaugurated yet. And all of a sudden the border patrol agents, in spite of orders to the contrary, said, you know, we got to do our job here. It's important to do our job. And that's that. So New York, if you want to know what your city is going to look like at the end of Comrade de Blasio's regime, just take a good, hard look at San Francisco and you will totally understand it. I have seen your fe- your future and your future is bleak and wanting. That's it for today. Hey, by the way, as always, if you're listening on YouTube, on YouTube, just uh, click the subscribe button and keep those comments going. I love your comments, even when they're obscene, whatever. Click the bell so you automatically get notified of anything coming up, any new shows that get dropped on YouTube. If you're on an iPhone, on a smartphone, use your app, your podcast app, On the iPhone, there's a Google Play app on the Android platform, and just click it, search for Financial Survival Network, click it a bunch of times and subscribe. Hey, while you're at it, uh, just subscribe on iTunes on the application that's on your computer, PC, or Mac, and just type in Financial Survival Network in the iTunes store. You see the show come up, keep clicking it a bunch of times till you're subscribed. Show automatically gets delivered to your computer whenever we post a new one. That's it for today. Everybody uh, probably won't be doing any shows tomorrow. We'll pick up again on Thursday. This has been another Triple Lutz Report. Kerry Lutz signing off. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 